Okay, we are just about ready to start. I want to welcome everyone for coming. Um, please, sir. This is the um, James A. McKee Association's monthly community conversation. And this month, we are having two uh, important speakers. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the coordinator of this program, Don Hollister. And all I can do is take up time because <laughs> both of you, you are, certainly know Brian House, the president, current president of Village Council. And you may have read in the paper but not met Bob uh, Hausman. Wasserman. Wasserman. You were in school with Bob House at Antioch. Anyway, old man disease. Bob Wasserman's my cousin. I should have forgotten his name. Uh, oh, Donnie always gets confused. Yeah. So. And then we also have uh, Bob Haas. Bob Haas here. Is Bob Haas. Yes. Also. yes. So we have uh, the Bobs. So. And uh, however, Brian originally had this slot exclusively, so I will just defer to him to lead the program. All right. Thanks, John. Um, so. Uh, I've been your council president for a year and a half, um, on council now for five and a half years, and um, I brought a handout, unfortunately, I, yeah, Dave, I don't think you got one, uh, and, um, but uh, my printer uh, died, so I didn't make as many copies as I wanted to. But I want to explain this document, but um, I'm going to highlight a few things, and my experience at these meetings has always been that uh, I want to keep my comments uh, short and give you the opportunity to question, grill me, whatever uh, you want. And uh, I think our discussions have always been lively and, and interesting. And I'm sure that there are things on uh, this very active uh, community group's mind. Um, so just to explain the document, you are seeing this before anybody else. I just updated it this morning um, because I thought it was apropos, and we typically do a mid-year review of our, uh, of our yearly goals. Um, if you paid attention last year, we reformatted them so that we look at um, what we think we can get done in a year. So those are the 2019 actions, and then what we see is ongoing things because most of these goals related to housing, infrastructure, uh, village policing, etc., are ongoing, continuous improvement, lots to be done. But you know, we wanted to think about year on year what's manageable. So um, the color coding indicates uh, what we've done in, uh, you know, that we've completed within, I guess, under six months. Uh, the yellow gold color is what is in progress. And the reds are flags that they haven't really gotten attention. And at our June 17th meeting, when our new village manager, Josue Salmaran, uh, starts, uh, we're going to do our mid-year review and talk about, are these still the priorities? So I always think of the 2019 village goals as a, a living document. And um, I've been happy to say, if you looked at 2018, it was pretty much all green. So we did a lot, we've accomplished a lot. Um, some things, you know, we're still figuring out. And uh, I guess what I wanted to tease out, just so you know what I'm thinking about in terms of priorities, are kind of the four things that we emphasized with uh, Josue um, coming in that we expect him to address right, right away. And his contract is very clear that in six months, we're going to be doing an intensive review, benchmarked around the goals and the things that we want to see action on. And, uh, and that's going to kind of sort of assess that we feel that we made the right decision, which, which we really think we did. And um, uh, my understanding is that maybe, is Josue going to be coming to this meeting next month? I haven't invited him. Okay. I, I, well, I, I'm sure he will plan to come uh, uh, regardless of whether he gets a formal invite or not. Um, so uh, let me lay out sort of what are our four things that we've really prioritized. First of all, village policing. Um, it has become clear, and I think all of you know, that we 
you know, have um, the Bobs here to help us figure out how we can implement our guidelines for village policing, uh, looking at uh, the department, communications, the community's expectations, etc. I think we've done a lot of really good policy work. I think the Justice System Task Force made a lot of progress. I mean, we have Florence as a great example, a social worker presence in the uh, Village Police Department, which is super important. Um, but we still have a lot to figure out. And I think we are among every community across the nation in trying to figure out the complexities around effective policing practices. Um, I can also say that uh, I still remember a letter that was produced from 1995, which if I hadn't seen the date on it, I would have thought was written yesterday. I mean, we have similar problems that, you know, kind of blow up, that, you know, ebb and wane, wax and wane, that sort of thing. Um, but we are really serious about delivering on our community's expectations around safety, around respect, and, um, you know, maintaining what we love about Yellow Springs. And that's, again, why we, you know, have talked about this village policing piece, and we're investing a lot of time and energy into that. Um, so, you know, again, these are the things that we made very clear to Josue and in our final interviews with our four candidates, um, this is what we were looking at. Secondly is housing. Um, so, obviously, one angle we've been taking on that is uh, affordability and how can we keep a certain amount of housing stock affordable. Um, we have partners like Home Inc., but we also have other uh, partners that are burgeoning that want to get into this space. And so we're really excited about the prospects for not just affordable housing, but for all types of housing. Um, if you've been paying attention to council meetings, you will have seen that we've um, uh, done a lot of work around uh, vision, mission, setting goals. And our next step is to establish a plan that will really look at what we're going to do with um, not just the glass farm, but also how we're going to work with other developers who are um, looking at things like the Kinney Farm and uh, what might happen at Antioch College and, and other areas. Um, we definitely want to promote infill, and we want this to be um, balanced and sustainable. Uh, but the reality is this is critical to our schools. This is critical to um, uh, our community in general. Uh, we know from the housing assessment that we need to continue to inject more youth into our community, and we need to maintain diversity overall. So, um, but at the same time, we also are, uh, you know, prioritizing aging in place and all the other things that are really important for all members of our community. So, we were really excited about Hostway's background in housing and affordability. Um, that was a major factor in the decision that we made. Uh, he has got a proven record of success in this area. Um, third thing is infrastructure. Uh, and again, this is something that uh, is not unique to Yellow Springs. I will say, I think, um, and I've said this before at council table, past councils could have been a little bit more proactive about addressing infrastructure. And so when I got on council, I was dealing with a water plant that was languishing for 50 years. So we had to raise utility rates. That wasn't an easy decision to make. Um, we are now finding out that, you know, we've got sewers that we can't just reline them, we've got to replace them. They are crumbling. Um, we've got sidewalk infrastructure that we care about to maintain our walkability. We've got the sewer study that we're doing. Uh, I mean, you name it. Um, it. We had a document from Johnny Burns that was many pages long of all the things that we're trying to tackle. Plus, we have to think about with um, the last piece that I'm going to mention, economic development, how do we make sure that we have a proper electric system that's going to support that activity, that's going to keep us being a thriving community. So this is why things like the lodging tax, which in its first year earned over 53000 I had said that I thought it would be north of 40000 Everybody thought, no way. First year, over 53000 that is money that can help us to sustain the fact that we are a destination town. 
I don't see that changing, right? I think we need to balance that, but that's a part of our identity, and it's part of why we have a thriving downtown. Um, but we've got to think beyond that. Paid parking, and it's in this goals uh, sheet, is something that I'm advocating strongly for. Again, I think it's appropriate that uh, visitors that we welcome in this community help us support the infrastructure needs that we have. And I will say in general, our staff is being really creative around thinking about how we stay in the black. Again, when I came on council, we were in the red, um, and uh, it took several years to uh, get out of being in a deficit budget. I have no intention, as long as I'm a part of council, to uh, let us go back into the red. So we've got to again think about if we want to maintain all the great services we have and we want to have the amazing community we do, how do we pay for these infrastructure needs um, and take it seriously? Um, and again, I think more could have been done 20 years ago to anticipate this, but we're doing it now and you know, very serious about it. So I mentioned the fourth thing, economic development. Um, this is something that we continue to be serious about. Uh, you know, we were very lucky, I think, to get Cresco to come into town and we're seeing more benefits around that. They're already talking about expanding their workforce. There's been a lot of activity around keeping EnviroFlight in town. Uh, we didn't think that was a possibility, but the conversations may be suggesting otherwise. That is uh, you know, great for our tax base and great for our locals in terms of having high paying jobs. Uh, I can say that there are several other uh, interested parties looking at the CBE and other places in town. There, there is plenty of activity. The message that Yellow Springs is open for sustainable business <laughs> is out there. And we are going to continue to monitor what's going to be the right fit for Yellow Springs. But I think, you know, we can't deny the fact that, you know, with our size of community, with, you know, trying to manage utility rates and other affordability issues, that we have to have some kind of balance with all these things. So it's very complex. Uh, I, you know, welcome all participation and input because I'm not going to say that, you know, we are, you know, at the, on the top of this tower and got it all figured out. But I will say again that Josue is gonna uh, really inject some great know-how and energy to help us accomplish these goals. The other key part, and it's why I love coming to this meeting, is we need to be constantly, uh, I guess, reminded and informed about what kind of decisions make sense, don't make sense, and uh, so that we can kind of craft what the best policies uh, are for the village. So with that, um, I wanted to make sure that there was plenty of opportunity to, again, ask me questions, grill me, make comments, uh, uh, let me know um, what I should be thinking about. Who is your point person for economic development? So. Um, Right now, we have the Economic Sustainability Commission, um, which has, uh, we revived that two years ago. Um, I was initially the council liaison before I became president. Uh, Lisa Krieger is now. Um, it is a very motivated and diverse group. Um, uh, you know, we've got everything from, you know, representation for the chamber, Karen Wintrow, to the nonprofit community, Susan Jennings, um, uh, a lot of real interest. Um, Saul Greenberg is the chair of that committee, and so they've been providing a lot of capacity. Um, you know, we did uh, pass a formal incentive, village incentive policy, so that we stopped making those decisions ad hoc, and we actually have a document to look at. Um, we also are, you know, reviving the revolving loan fund, which is, you know, a smaller bit of money, but a way to help some of our businesses uh, businesses stay in town um, and also you know help with uh, for example um, our, our new business green team uh, you know was very interested as they're trying to improve that space to think about these kind of micro loans um, the other uh, piece of that is uh, myself our village manager uh, Denise and Johnny meet regularly to talk about economic development um, we have a uh, economic development fund. Right now, we've got about eighty thousand in that, um, and 
we have been interested in using that to plant other seeds that would make sense to encourage this activity. Um, we've, you know, we've thought about, uh, you know, do we hire somebody? Uh, we used to have um, Sarah in that position as economic development director. Um, the other piece of capacity, and I referenced it before, is our community development corporation. Um, and I, I want to indicate the, the designated part of that. Um, this is, uh, uh, remember, Community Resources was a um, community improvement corporation. It was not designated, so it did not need to follow um, uh, Sunshine Laws. All right? The designated means that you have elected officials that are part of that body. And this is, you know, for the most part, an open meeting. You can still have executive session around property, you know, negotiations, but in general, those are open meetings. Right now, Antioch College, uh, the chamber, the community foundation, the village, the township, and the schools are all actively meeting to get a 501c3 together and to move this forward. So we're, we're thinking about that a lot as, as helping to, um, drive some of this activity. Uh, better market the CBE, um, do something at Dayton Railroad Street, because that sort of sad dirt parking lot thing needs to be uh, uh, addressed. Uh, potentially think about um, uh, what might happen with the firehouse if, uh, if that property is, is opened up. So this has been a great forum for that sort of coordinated decision making um, that really came to the forefront when we uh, heard all the conversations around uh, the township levy, the school levy, the utility rate increase. Um, we are responding in part to the fact that we need to all be in communication uh, more consistently to plan for those things. I admire that everything that you've said that's going on looking toward the future, but how did we get in the position of possibly losing in viral flight? and all that employment and economic benefits that we're talking about trying to get and we don't maintain what we already have. Right. Uh, I think that, I mean, that's been a little bit hard to unravel. Um, I think part of it was uh, our understanding was that they were moving to Kentucky. You know, they had built this new facility. Uh, the uh, individuals that were involved in EnviroFlight that live in town indicated that they were moving. And in fact, that may be the case. Or we don't know for sure. Um, but did it bring to light that um, the village can, you know, be as proactive as possible, you know, about making sure that we're paying attention to those businesses? Definitely. And so. As soon as uh, it was brought to our attention that there might be some mixed messages from the village, um, we made it very clear we want you to stay. We had a really productive meeting with the county, um, uh, with the, uh, the Department of Development and, and some of the other players, uh, Dayton Development Coalition, about what incentives might keep them here. So I can't totally answer that. Um, but I can say that uh, better communication uh, uh, should happen. And, and so that's something that uh, we'll take responsibility for and be more proactive about in the future. Um, but it is not clear that they really want to stay. So Can I jump in? Yes. Uh, in the 90s, there were a couple business retention uh, task force and reports. And one of the simple things was village staff were instructed to touch base twice a year with each of the major employers. And now, uh, how what that means could be very different, but at least a formal, how's it going, anything you want to tell us, but ideally a cup of coffee, a, a little more casual side to it repeatedly, and we assumed it was going to be the manager, or at that point there was an assistant manager. It wasn't a hired economic development person. Right, right. Um, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, I mean, I will say, uh, again, this community development corporation, um, Lisa Abel in particular, uh, took up the reins on this and, um, and has really kind of led the charge for this, you know, opening up communication and engagement. 
So I do think the, the Community Development Corp is going to help us with that. Um, I think we need to figure out, you know, uh, better what the village's role is, and, uh, and, and this definitely, um, you know, when I think about, I wasn't here at the time, but some of the things with uh, Vernay that, you know, I know there are different sides to that story, but maybe the village could have done a better job then too. I mean, I, I don't want to totally speak out of turn, but I think that, you know, we have a role in this, and of course the chamber does too. Yeah. I don't think the village has to do everything. Right. Um, I know of informal groups of people that are meeting regularly to talk about macro economic issues, and that's, that's fine, but we somehow have to make sure that the village policies mesh with what's actually happening. And so that means at least being aware of those informal groups if, if not. And I'll just give you an example. One day I was, was in Tom's market chatting with Tom and saying, well, how much longer are you going to run the store? I don't know. I am getting older. Who's going to take it over after you? I don't know. There isn't a, a clear transition right. plan, all right? That would be a catastrophe in this village if it didn't go smoothly, if Tom didn't find a buyer for that store. That's the kind of thing that we have to look a little bit forward at, because we just, we assume everything is just fine. Sure. Okay? Um, it's not clear I get to know firsthand about the drugstore, because I'm part of being the landlord of the drugstore, but that business is going to continue. Okay? Because the new company is a little iffy. Um, so our economics aren't just the, the larger manufacturers. There, there are hundreds of people that are employed in, in businesses that are critical to the health of this community. Yes. Paul? Yeah. I have a couple issues and we don't have time to discuss them. Let me just label them. Affordable housing. I have asked dozens of times how much is enough. I have not gotten any answer. There are millions of people who would love to live in Yellow Springs but can't afford it. How many are we aiming for? We need to balance people with income against people with, that can't contribute substantially to the economy. When is enough for Home Inc. and for efforts to bring in more people that are marginally able? The travel study, the bicycle friendly. Active transportation plan. Yes. I wrote a letter to planning commission. Did you see that? Yes. Okay, I'd like you to address those issues. I think it, it would be a disaster to make it easier to park at Tom's, to close Short Street, to make the main corner of town difficult for trucks to turn, even since it's a detour twice a year. Right. If you look at Church Street and Xenia, there are five feet of rut from, from semis turning that corner because they made the corner just as recommended in that study. Right. Okay. At, uh, economic development, it's been mentioned, the, the X business incubator, it's gone. It shouldn't have gone. I don't know what process Planning Commission and Council used to make that decision, but I feel it was a bad decision. Which which the, business incubator? The one at Bell's or no? The, the old seat plant. The, oh, right. Millworks. Millworks. Mm -hmm. Okay. The street between here and there is uh, impossible during the summer. It should be one way or one side parking or something. Since you've committed to that, many of the proposed developments over the years. The downtown businesses have fought because it would take business away from downtown. Here we have one more uh, taking the business away from downtown. Uh, infrastructure, one comment. Many places crown their roads so water runs off them. Mm -hmm. All of the repairs over the last five years or so, water puddles in the middle of the street because there's zero crown. Here, here. Right? So, uh, that's my comments. I hope we can talk about them sometime. 
Yeah, and I, let me just say uh, something about the first two, um, and, and I think other ones are, are, are good thoughts. Uh, the other two, I, I definitely think uh, we can think better about how to do uh, roads, for example. Um, but in terms of affordable housing, what I will say is we are working on um, defining what's enough uh, and, uh, and moving something forward that, of course, would be discussed at you know, council meetings and we would ask for input. Um, but that is part of um, the goal with creating a housing plan is um, we want to define that and also think about how we work with other, both private and affordable developers to reach those goals. Um, so there will be an opportunity to weigh in on something more quantifiable. Um, uh, I think we all agree that, that we need to do that. Uh, the other thing that we're doing in relation to that is, is thinking about how we develop relationships with, um, with different uh, providers, and that includes other affordable providers. Um, you know, we've recently learned some of the private developers also set up an affordable housing, you know, aspect to their business. We're talking to them. Um, active transportation plan, all of those comments that you made, Paul, were, were great. Um, you know, for example, anything that we might do downtown, we would definitely need to do a traffic study and think about the, the, the trucks that unload at Tom's and everything. I think uh, the way to look at the active transportation plan, if you haven't dug into it, is that you know these were ideas from the community uh, over uh, an eight month eight month period where we you know were at the farmers market and other places getting ideas, um, but none of those ideas would happen unless there was a public discussion about them. All right, and the first step to that is to do a. Um, sort of a, a temporary transportation uh, exercise. So let's say, for example, we got serious about um, thinking about Short Street. You know, the, the idea has been like put bollards on both sides, sometimes close it off, you know, like uh, more bike parking, have a patio, do some other things, but bollards that can be removed. So if we still needed to get like a truck in there or something. So that's, I mean, not been vetted, but that idea is out there. If we were gonna do that, we would start by trying it out, put some paint, some cones, see how it works, but all of that would have to be a public discussion. Um, so, so don't look at anything in the active transportation plan as a done deal. That was just kind of getting some ideas on paper to move things forward. Um, and then the other ideas, Paul, like I, I definitely, I'm gonna think about those. Uh, I think they're good ones about economic development and, and the roads, yes. I have a question. Uh, I understand uh, the governor has some ties to Yellow Springs. Yep. Has there been any effort to reach out to the governor about the EnviroFlight and other companies in terms of retaining companies for Yellow Springs? So not about those things in particular. I will say that, um, yeah, uh, actually, uh, it's kind of cool. Governor DeWine uh, answers my texts. So, uh, and uh, so he does. Uh, think you know he grew up in Yellow Springs um, he you know thinks a lot about this area and um, you know I think the fact that he supports local government and the importance of you know uh, funding what local governments do is, is a good sign we'll see how far we get um, we haven't haven't thought specifically about something like the Enviro flight thing um, but uh, that that could be a, uh, a tool in the box to pull out um, I, I will definitely say he's been very receptive. Um, and uh, you know, I think many of you know one of my other hats is that I work for Rails to Trails. Um, so I'm very interested in environmental sustainability, um, active transportation, health. And uh, it, it, I was able to get a lot of meetings uh, prior to um, him being elected uh, with folks. So we're on their radar. You know, I, I always have my Yellow Springs pin, and uh, and I'll use whatever advantages I can. So, okay. let's steer this a little bit towards the uh, priority around policing. Yes, but I'll let you frame that. Well, I mean, you know, I think uh, uh, 
you know, again, our guidelines for village policing lay out a pretty ambitious policy about what we want to see, uh, you know, from our department. Um, I will say without a doubt, we're concerned about the disconnect between um, many of our community members and our police department. And, uh, you know, it's something since I've been on council, uh, it's uh, taken a significant amount of time. Uh, I think it's very important. Uh, but also, it's risen to, it was probably the number one uh, factor in our choice for a new village manager because if we don't resolve some of the issues around this, it hinders our ability to get a lot of other things done. All right, so that's kind of how I think about it practically. But, um, you know, this has been an area where I think, um, you know, we've got to continuously improve. And uh, this is why uh, the council not only made a commitment to um, making the justice system task force a permanent commission, um, it's gonna be restructured in a way that I think will be more effective um, and, uh, and maybe more uh, productive. Um, but they did a lot actually. And it's also the reason why we committed um, to having an assessment done um, by Bob Wasserman and Bob Haas and their team. And uh, so maybe, that's a good time to uh, let uh, Bob and Bob talk a little bit about uh, what they're doing. Okay, thank you, Brian. Yeah. Uh, it's, I took this assignment because I actually love Yellow Springs. I went to Antioch. After grad school, I came back as uh, Howard Cahill's assistant village manager for a year. And uh, I got to know a lot of the intricacies here. And. Uh, the former Chief Jim McKee. I learned a lot from him. I spent a lot of time with him, with his, he and his whole family. Um, and I really think the village is very, very special. And I'm inter I was interested in that because as policing evolves in this country, there are a number of different approaches that police take in dealing with its community. There are a number of its people who are concerned about its policing in the community, and there are a number of people who are not concerned about policing in the community. So there are different perceptions about a whole variety of issues. There are some issues internally in the department, and I will say, however, that most of the employees of the police department want to be its good officers, they want to make a difference, and the question is, what kind of support and guidance is necessary? And what is it that the community really is saying when they say that they are concerned about certain issues, it's relative to policing? So we've been doing a review of all aspects of policing in the village. I've spent much of my time in interviews with a wide, widely diverse variety of folks in the community. And I've gotten lots of input from people about what their concerns are, it's interesting. There's more said about their concerns than about what the vision should be for the future. But those concerns, if they're, you know, in one sense, perceptions of reality, and all of those visions are important. And there are lots of different, there are lots of different uh, or senses about where things have to go. Bob has spent much of his time, Bob Haas, interviewing members of the department and getting a perception, a sense of how they view its policing, how the chief views its policing, and what they would like to see. I should say that I've been in policing now for 54 years. And uh, I started out sort of my first job was I was a dispatcher with the police department here when I was at Antioch for a while. And uh, I've kind of made that my, my career. I've done lots of different things in lots of agencies. I've been a, I was a police commissioner, interestingly, in Bosnia after the war, uh, the international police. But uh, I've seen lots of different things. And Bob Haas retired a year and a half ago as the police commissioner in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, he's been a chief in a small, smaller community. 
He was the uh, Secretary of Public Safety in Massachusetts under uh, Mitt Romney, uh, and he came up in the policing systems in New Jersey. But he's very experienced and very thoughtful. And he and I are very much in sync about what the future of its policing in this country is. And its policing is not really primarily about law enforcement, but it's about problem solving. Problem solving. If people in a community call the police or come to the police for a wide variety of problems, and they want help in seeing those problems get resolved. Sometimes an arrest is appropriate. Other times being sophisticated in how you deal with complex social issues is important. The police increasingly in our society are dealing with uh, people who have mental health issues and police must be very sophisticated in how you deal with those, with those people in a supportive and helpful manner and it's complicated but they need to develop that capacity. There are lots of different kind of situations to which you have to respond. I hear from many people in the community in Yellow Springs that they want police officers who live here. When Jim McKee was the chief, they all lived here. And they all lived here primarily because they were from Yellow Springs. Jim found people and said, I want you. And he became a police officer. And he kind of developed this sense. There were a few who moved to town, but uh, it was strongly oriented. You can no longer, under state law, mandate that officers have to live in the community in which they work. And uh, what I really hear people saying, however, even those who say, we want officers to live here, is they want officers who know them and who they know and that they have a relationship with. A two-sided relationship. Modern, it's policing. We hear the term, it's community, it's policing. And it was developed in the late 1980s. Actually, it came out of, a, of uh, an executive session at Harvard University at the Kennedy School, which I happen to be a member of. And there was a sense that police were just spending time in their patrol cars driving around. Well, they never were out engaging with the community. In the 1940s, the police walked the beat, and they knew the kids, and they knew everybody. And indeed, back when I was in Antioch in 1922, no, um, in uh, 1960 to 65, I remember just before I came that Jim McKee was hired as a police officer. And the village council hired him. I don't know if this was widely known, but he, was, he worked at the high school. And they said, you know, we're having some issues with kids. Jim knows all the kids. Let's bring him on as a police officer. And he did know the kids. And he knew how to deal with kids. And it was like a game changer in how policing started to be done in Yellow Springs. There were issues back then. But there was a caring about the community that we find in community policing. What most, what's happened in most places, chiefs of police say, we're doing community policing. That means that you're a community policing officer and you go and engage with people. The rest of the police officers just drive around. That's not what community policing is about. It's community policing is engagement with the entire its community in neighborhoods. What would happen, we've been thinking, if you divided Yellow Springs into, into six neighborhoods? and assigned an officer to be the officer who gets to know that neighborhood, and they get to know him, and he's their advocate, or she's their advocate. And they're accountable for the quality of the relationship with people who live there. So Bob and I have been working hard the last couple of years with doing exactly that in Chicago, trying to model. Chicago's a terribly troubled city, but putting into place a pilot of how that might work. From, 19, from 2014 to 2016, 
I worked in New York City with the police department outside the police commissioner's door. And we did that in every precinct in New York City where officers are now assigned to neighborhoods and they get to know the people. And it has been astounding. It's the difference in public perception of the police and how police have a different sense of the public. We're individuals. If you live here and I'm a police officer, I want to know you. And I want you to know me. That means I have to listen to you talk and explain what you think about. And hearing that and seeing you seeing that I care, in the best sense, I give you a little business card and say, if you have a problem, you really want some, not an emergency, but you want to talk about an issue, call my cell number and leave me a message. I'll get right back to you. I'll get back to you so we can be helpful and caring and people will know us and we can get trained. Some of us can be trained in dealing with if people with certain kinds of mental illness, with others who are the victims of domestic violence, of the youth, all of that. So that develop within policing a team of people who sort of have competencies in different areas and they help each other in dealing with problems that come up. So we're going through the assessment and we will issue a report, probably late in June, that says here's what we found. And here is a set of recommendations that can make its policing in Yellow Springs something that really is treasured by those who live here. <clears throat> that they say our police care about us and know us and treat us fairly and compassionately, but focus on problem solving. When I worked in Boston in the police department, I was heading operations back in 19, I think it was 1976, so we did a study of calls for service. All of the people who called the police department and where those calls for service were, and they plotted them out and the researchers at Northeastern University came and told us something that was astounding to us. It was that 50% of the calls we got were to locations we went to 12 or more times a year. Yet we treated them as an incident. They weren't an incident. It was an ongoing problem. And just treating it as an incident didn't solve the problem. You have to think about what's actually happening and engage with people to say what can we do that prevents this situation from continuing as a, a thing that's problematic. Getting to think that way about its policing, not just we respond to the call, but what's going on and do it in conversation with your geographic the community and talk through how do we deal with this stuff best. But that's kind of our philosophical wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Approach. And Bob will talk a bit, because uh, he's better at this than I am. <laughs> but uh, there is a commitment here to figure out how to make this really a reality. <clears throat> the world is changing. Social media is changing things. Our national administration is changing things. And the world is not going to be the same in the future as it was years ago. But Yellow Springs is a community that attracts people who largely have a shared set of values about the kind of community that they want. And policing has to plug into that and understand that. And that will change slowly over time, but the degree to which police really openly engage with the community and have transparency about what goes on is the groundwork for creating a policing system that really has respect of the community and of the officers who police that community. Well, so I'm that's kind of where we're going. Bob says, but I'd like to interject something just because I can't stay too much longer. Is there a problem in so much as the training, the qualifications that we put down for officers we hire, that the training they've had isn't in sync 
with what we want them to do. I think one of the problems that exists and exists in many places in communities like this is that state is that new officers have to go to a state mandated training program in a state I was going to say a state institution, but that's not, <laughs> that's not quite the right term. But in a state accredited police academy. And what they learned there as the approach to policing is not necessarily in sync with here. So it's one of the things that, uh, that I feel strongly about, and I'm going to put it in the report. Okay. I'll just say one is that, and a challenge to all of you, because I think. You all need to get engaged in this. Is the media here? Can't say this. I'm not going to. But we no, need to have. This is being video. I know. <laughs> so I mean, this is what I did in New York City, and we can do the same thing here. Recruits would come out of the police academy in New York City. 8.5 a million small classes of new police officers, of a thousand and fifty officers. They all went out to precincts, and they didn't know anybody. So they'd walk around scared because, you know, look at these people in the community are looking at me. And they didn't know anything about the community. So we put in, we asked in every precinct for volunteers from the community to be a community partner. And when a new officer is to come in, the community partner gets the officer first and introduces them to the history and the community itself and walks them around and introduces them to people in the neighborhood and talks about expectations. And what a difference. We tried it first in 15 precincts. It's now in all 77. We can do the same thing here. In every neighborhood, you could all be a community partner. So when we hire a new officer, you get time with the officer in your neighborhood to introduce them to people in the neighborhood, to concerns in the neighborhood, and you could become a partner in seeing that policing reflects what the concerns of the neighborhood are. That's just an idea. But I think it works. Because good, it's policing. It's policing that the community is a partner in, and if they really are a partner, they share responsibility for the outcome. And that's where we want to go. So a second part to your answer, I mean, Bob laid a really great foundation in terms of talking about, but I think what's missing in a lot of police agencies is it's business as usual, right? I go to the academy, I learn how to be a police officer, and I do policing things, right? And I'm a firm believer, and I know Bob, as we've been working together so long, is that I really believe about what's the outcome I'm trying to achieve, and then working backwards, right? Because what tends to happen is police departments lose their way. Something distracts them, a crisis intervenes with them, and they move off target, and they don't get back on the pathway again. One of the things we talked a lot with the new uh, village manager, and the city council, and stuff like that is, is, is there an opportunity here, and I firmly believe there is, to make a dramatic change in terms of how policing is administered in this community? And it goes largely to what Bob says, because one of the fundamental principles that we're talking about is police legitimacy, where the police derive their authority from the community, not from statutory authority, what they can do legally, but what does the community want to have shaped and what kind of policing service does it want in its community and the police department being responsive to those kinds of things. So it's training our officers, changing their mindset, and it's a very fundamental mind shift between criminal justice and social justice. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about a social justice philosophical construct. Equity, looking for people's welfare, being people who can intervene, help people in need, build relationships, nothing the police department does shouldn't be without some collaborative relationships and partnerships. The police department does not do this on its own. It's part of a larger community, it has to be integrated into the community, it has to be responsive to the community. So I, I think what the officers need to do is get reorientated from what they learned in the academy to thinking very differently about my, my role and mission is in the community. It's about being a, a social agent. Right? As we say, Jim McKee was picking out the people he didn't right. to do that. Right. He didn't get the right. graduates from the right. academy. Right. So, it's coming the end of June on the big screen. It's <laughs> <laughs> our report with the recommendations. Yes. That's my, I guess, my question. You're going to make this report. Who's going to see that report? And is it going to be able to be funneled back to the community? We will do a very large public presentation initially at council, and we may do a community forum following that. 
this, this cannot be a report that just goes on a shelf. It's action-oriented, and it lays out steps that need to happen to get where I think everybody, most people will agree we have to go. Thank you. I'm not interested in something that just does a, a report. Oh, the Wasserman study of 2019, I think I got that up here someplace. <laughs> people have to say, we're all Wasserman police officers now, no. um, is uh, it's got to be a living document. It's got to be updated regularly, too. But it's got to have the energy to get people excited that if you all hear what this is going to be, you'll s nod your heads and say, yes, that's what we want, and I want to be a part of it. But that's where we want this to go. I'm sorry, only one question. No, go ahead. <laughs> How then, once the report is in place and you share it with the community, how do you proceed with training or how how is the staff, police staff, going to move to in that direction? We're going to lay out the things that ought to be done, and then it's up to the village and the village administration to see that it happens. We have a contract, and the contract is to produce the report, okay. and uh, and that's what we are doing, but we're trying to do it in a manner that it it can happen. And we're laying out a rational set of steps. And there's two critical components. One is how the police interacts with the community, engages the community. The other piece is internally. Am I satisfying my personnel, building their strength, making them more sophisticated in their skill set in a very structured way so they have a career path and they also feel like a valued member, not just of the police department, but of the community as well? Okay. So there are good officers here. Right. There really are. Right. But there's a third element, and that's how the community interacts with the police and gets in the way of the chief doing his job sometimes. There's this group that's analogous to the Tea Party that I consider venomous that is destructive in terms of, of the kind of community policing. Well, there are those challenges that have to be addressed, and we'll be talking about those. Okay. And then I can add that um, from council's perspective, first of all, we would not have invested this money in this project um, if we weren't going to actively use this. I mean, it is, as I stated before, it's a big reason why we made decisions such as with our village manager. So we have a strong expectation and he will have objectives that are tied to that, that we'll be evaluating in those first six months. Um, the uh, the new chief contract will also have objectives that are going to be tied to these recommendations. Um, so we have some really strong expectations around the outcomes of this. And you know, with our justice system commission um, and of course council being actively involved, uh, our mayor is also engaged in our justice system improvements. Um, so there, there are going to be uh, a lot of uh, a lot of things, concrete deliverables that we're going to expect to see. And I do want to emphasize that I think similar to other things we've done, like with the active transportation plan, we will need to have that community forum because the whole idea is, as Bob emphasized, of it being a living document is we need to you know make sure that. Uh, how do we refine some of these things? Uh, how do we make sure that they're addressing all the needs? Um, and, and that's part of what we get from the community. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Yes, Dave, I have a question too. One is, are you going to write a book about this? <laughs> okay. uh, no, I only do a movie. Okay. <laughs> I'll do that. Um, I've had the idea for a while of uh, providing housing for police officers, maybe through Home Inc. or some other organization, where the housing arrangement would encourage them to stay in the community. So that might be something to investigate. There's another aspect which is maybe negative in, in terms of uh, relationship to the community, but our village relies heavily on complaints for upkeep of road edges and, and, and such. The police ride their cars around all day. <laughs> they go through all of the streets. If they notice that you can't see it safely at an intersection, they could let the, the crew know about that. The crew could then 
leave a note or otherwise follow up and, say, and solve that safety issue. That's another role that the police could take, which may interfere with their relationship with the community, or maybe better. No, I don't think it does interfere at all. The police have a responsibility, for instance, I've always thought in the departments I've worked with, if when they're on patrol at night, street lights out, they should make a note of it and it should go to public works. There's a street light to be replaced. If there is a dangerous situation because because there's overgrown grass, you can tell the crew, mm -hmm. but if you also know the community, you could stop in and talk to the homeowner and say, that's really harmful. Could you, it would be helpful if you could cut that down. Mm -hmm. Problem solving, not, in, not necessarily enforcement, right. but solving the problem. Sure. And if you have officers who are trained with that mindset, it starts to deal with the issue that you're talking about. Thank you. Dave yes. had a yeah, question I'm, in the corner here. I'm glad you tried to put a stake in the heart of the residency because I think that's a significant canard that gets in a lot of it gets in the way uh, of things. Uh, in our task force, we talked a lot about policies and procedures. Didn't get to the opportunity to make it to dealing with to the relationship issue, and I'm sure you've talked about dealing with that. But I think that's a significant thing. I know that's a significant thing that a lot of people are concerned about. And at the meeting last night, you know, there were a lot of people I think they were expecting to be able to say, I am angry about this. And so at some point, you're probably going to have to allow people to say, I'm angry about this and beat up the I've chief. I've had a lot of them say that to me. I mean, publicly. I'm holding these interviews and people yeah. are saying, I'm angry about this. Yeah, I, I suspect, and I'm hearing it. Yeah, I suspect, you know, it, it might be valuable tactically to have one public so people can. I'm, I'm not sure about that. I'm just, I, yeah. well, I don't think it's a good idea either, but tactically it might work. Anyway, I think as far as getting to know the community, something that uh, would be valuable over time would having the police annually or more frequently, you know, formally meet with high school students who are learning to drive to talk about driving stops, things like that. You get to know the kids, the kids talk to their parents, they discover that the cops are not all, you know, ogres that are just trying to get them, they might, everybody might learn something. And this is a way, because of the lack these days of, of interaction, you know, you have to force it. This is a logical way of getting the police and the young people together so that people can get to know each other and learn about things that they need to learn about. I think that's a good idea. I think one of the issues that we are looking at is engagement with youth because they, are in the, they not only are an important part of the community, they are the future. And establishing that just the same as we think probably that the department should really figure out how to establish something like an explorer program for young, for young, for youth, who could start to get even a summer job at the, at the department and get an interest in policing and the community, and some of them may want to stay and become police officers. Yeah, we already do that with the fire department. Yeah, yeah. well that's odd. Yeah. But yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. We just had a meeting this morning with the uh, Big brothers, big sisters to start the police uh, bigs with badges. That very program we just did talked about that this morning. That's wonderful, You're way ahead of us. <laughs> We're trying. <laughs> to follow up. Well, yes. And then John Grody met the uh, children that were coming to school for his lawn every morning. Helped them out of the car for traffic at the same time. But he met every child that came to Mills Lawn every morning. Yes, and I think that really is an interesting thing, but I will say I want every officer to be doing that, or to be having engagement that they get to know the kids. It's really a, it's, it's an unusual thing, and, it, and John did start that, I think, and it still goes on under Brian today. He does that. That's an interesting thing. I worry about, the only thing I worry about, I've been there to see it, is that the traffic there is really is crazy because you have cars coming both ways. Nobody wants to really deal with it, yeah. as you know, but it is a danger. It's an interactive transportation plan to fix. Yeah, it is. A, <laughs> it's an interesting challenge, but it's interesting to watch. And the kids are wonderful. They really are. They're the future of our society. I have another question here. Yeah, so I was curious about what kinds of resources exist to help, you know, you said they come you out speak of up, please. So, so when the officers come out of their training and we need to reorient them, are there formal resources that exist for that happening or is it something that happens kind of just with mentoring and training? You mean when they come out of the, uh, 
or how their formal resources meaning I'm not sure I know what you mean. So does it rely on mentoring, for example, from the chief and from other existing officers, or are there more structured um, resources that are available to help guide that process? So the department has a formalized field training officer program. So officers never go out into the field directly at the academy. They spend a period of time mm -hmm. with trained FTOs. And these FTOs are orientating them to the philosophy of the department and the mindset of the department. So uh, in Cambridge, we used to say, if you're going to get the Cambridge pay, you're going to do it the Cambridge way. Mm -hmm. And we would take what they learn in the academy and reshuffle that around and change it. Because how, we want, how they're taught the police in the academy is going to be very different when they come here to the village. The other piece that's really important and we're talking a lot about is not sticking to the conventional trainings that officers get, but start to go outside that system. Who are the social service providers that could provide expertise and training to my officers? Who, how can we become the front end of a lot of these social services? How do we make sure that we're connecting people in need to the services they need and to make sure we have the training to do it competently and successfully in terms of mentoring people and getting them in the right direction so they get the support and you're enhancing their quality of life in the community. Right. I reflect back when I was years ago this was the uh, senior assistant to the police chief in Dayton after the riots and I ended up also uh, running the police academy and at that time we, we put in a process that before a recruit graduated from the police academy they had to spend three weeks interning in a social service agency in Dayton. And they came away with a very different view of available resources to help resolve things and the environment of certain things. It was really very good. But once I left, it didn't happen anymore. So my last comment for today is that expertise. On one hand, your expertise seems to be invaluable, OK? On the other hand, we, within our structures, we seem to always never quite be able to make a decision ourselves. So we always have to ask an expert. And then that expertise doesn't get disseminated among the people that are, that are actually doing the work. We, our police department hires a social worker instead of training the existing officers to have the sensitivity of a social worker. The social worker suddenly can't be out there in the community getting to know all the problems, okay? Our, our department has gotten a hierarchy. Never used to have a hierarchy in it. You know, people, officers are different from one another. They're not equal partners in, in policing the community. I think those are also important issues to think about. Our, we are our mindset that. these days is we always need an expert to help us do something, rather than let's feel the competence to do it ourselves. Right. And that the whole purpose of this plan and making sure that it's very structured and very definitive and has a direct purpose is to build that internal capacity and expertise. One of the things we've had a lot of conversations about with Florence and the chief is Florence is not just an external resource, she should be an internal resource. And so that's not up to Florence to deal with all the social service issues that need to be addressed within the community of the village, but helping the officers start to build that capacity because she's like, great internal resource to the officer. So you're spreading that, it's a force multiplier. You're spreading it across mm -hmm. nine or 10 people as opposed to one person trying to do that all by themselves. And that's what we've been doing. There's been a lot of training and the traumatic, uh, the, the, all the officers have been trained in CIT, which is mm -hmm. a term, uh, critical um, crisis intervention crisis team training. training. Yes. And actually and we, mandate, we mandate 40 hours of that training. So and they've also been trusted trained in the, all the officers been trained in the um, loss communication with all the suicides or the death, how to deal with it, and in the CI, in the um, training. So they, they're they getting the training that they need to deal with this community. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and don't you. forget about the scenario-based training. And the scenario-based training. So it's everything that they need to be good officers for this community. Yes. I like your precinct idea. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, as far as the police go in Yellow Springs, I have more rapport with my trash man <laughs> than being able to accomplish anything than I do with a policeman. We are thinking of having the police pick up the trash. <laughs> <laughs> no, I doubt they can. No, I think that's an important point. And, uh, 
these relationships are which a lot of it's about relationships and we got to have a structure that allows that to happen that's what people want in yellow springs mm -hmm. and there's a way to make that happen i think yeah um, Yellow Springs and Antioch, I don't think I've ever been afraid to be in the forefront of, of things. And mm -hmm. I would love to see Yellow Springs police officers not carry revolvers within the village limits. It makes them scary. They never use them. If they do use them, it's probably, it's been inappropriate. Um, but it would just make them more approachable, I think. And yeah, we may be the only town in the country that does that, but I think it could be the start of something. So I'll tell you a story, a quick story, about my time in Dayton. I had a recruit class, and in the recruit class was a young man whose father had been shot on duty and was very severely disabled, but he came to the graduation to give him his badge. And we had taught the recruits that, for example, if you see a drunk lying in the street, you needed to take him someplace where he could be taken care of. We dealt with a lot of these issues. And just after I left, the young man, Officer Mobley, who was a new recruit from the academy, was on the street and he, in, in a patrol car, and he saw a guy lying on the street, really having a very bad, he was an alcoholic and was, was quite drunk at all. And they, he, he picked him up and he put him in the back of his car and said, I'm going to take you to X center. And got back in the car and started to drive. And he didn't frisk the guy down and he pulled out a gun and shot the officer in the head and killed him. And that was the end of, for a while, teaching police officers that sensitivity. And not that he made a mistake, but it had it go, it had it, it moved things backward very quickly, and it had an impact on myself as well. But whether he carried a gun or not made no difference. Well, but it's the idea of there are things you can do at certain times. And as you look across the country right now, and what is going on, and the number of officers that are being shot, beside the fact that a lot of civilians are being shot, sometimes absolutely improperly, it's a very difficult time to do something like that. What I would add is also the nature of the business. Uh, you expect police to go into harm's way to protect others and protect the community. And so when you expect an officer to do that, you have to make sure they have the proper equipment to do that. What you're hoping they do, and what you train them to do, and you spend a lot of time training them to do, is to be responsible in terms of how they use those tools that they have. Um, and what you're gonna find in terms of the model that Bob and I are talking about is less reliance on the criminal justice aspects of policing and really using their skill set to really be social agents and provide for social justice. But those tools are essential. Um, It'd be nice to say, geez, if we could just close the village off just to our residents, that we wouldn't have to worry about that kind of potential violence or violent people in our community that the police don't have to respond to. But if something's happening and you want to call the police, they, you don't want them to say, oh, I can't go there because it's too dangerous. You expect them to go in, and you expect them to deal with that situation. You expect them to deal with it responsibly. So it's an unfortunate reality I think we find ourselves in. Uh, but um, I, I think it's, it's a situation that um, given the nature of the business they're in, th that you want to make sure that they can adequately protect themselves, but also protect you as well. There are lots of people out there carrying guns, many who should not. It's a very, you know, in the UK, where many police officers in London, for example, do not carry a firearm. And they, it has been proposed that a lot more of them start to be armed, and the officers say, we don't want it but they don't have the number of guns in the society. Mm -hmm. So now if you read the papers, everybody's stabbing everybody else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, knife crime is a big thing, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a challenge. It's just uh, our society is the problem. And you have to be realistic about 
the nature of our society. Yes, when back. I just, as we're almost closing, I just want to tell a quick story about Jim McKee. Uh, years ago, our house was broken into when we were out of town, and what was taken was a big piggy bank that we had on, the, um, on our bed frame um, that every night we'd put our change into it. And we had no idea who had broken in or what had happened. And Jim found the two young people who had done it. And he found them because he said, these kids, these two kids are spending more money in town than they should have. <laughs> and that was how well he knew the community. That was how well he knew those kids. And I thought that was a interesting um, experience. Let's just take um, one more question here. I just want to thank you for your perspective and sharing it with our community and our council for uh, bringing you to Yellow Springs, back to Yellow Springs. Um, a lot of what you're saying is, is very valid and we do need to move towards a positive approach um, so that we can in commute improve our community and policing. So thank you. Well, I thank you all for having us. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you guys very much.